The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. All right, um, so good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, wherever you are. And thank you so much for joining us uh, for this progress webinar. This will be uh, solid principles of user experience. Uh, I think those of us who are in the developer um, mindset, uh, we know solid principles uh, pretty well, but are there parallels to it in the UX world? Uh, we at Progress, we have been making uh, UI components and frameworks uh, for .NET and JavaScript uh, for web, desktop, and mobile uh, for over 15 years now, but I don't think we have quite uh, managed to bridge the mindset gap between developers and, and designers. So I'm so glad that we're restarting this conversation uh, today. And I'm very excited to bring on our speaker, uh, Jessica Engstrom. She is a good friend uh, to many of us here, but more importantly, she is an absolute expert in the UX world. Uh, and I'm gonna be your host, uh, Sam Basu, uh, for today. And my job here is to kind of get out of the way as quickly as possible so we can have Jessica uh, speak to you. I think she's got some awesome content to, sh uh, to share. Uh, so Jessica, you're still on, uh, you're on. Can you hear us? Can you speak? I'm right here. All right, hey, hey. So Jessica, uh, you're in Stockholm, Sweden, right? Yes, I am. All right, and I'm in dreary and cold Pennsylvania. Uh, but before I uh, hand it to Jessica, let's uh, just talk about one or two quick um, housekeeping items. So first thing is you are uh, giving us an hour of your time and uh, we value that uh, a lot. So let's make sure you get the most out of it. So ask away questions. Anything you want to ask, uh, Jessica is here to answer uh, and I'll help maybe streamline some of the Q&A. Um, but any, any concerns you have, any questions that you have re that relate to what you are uh, up to uh, at your workspace, uh, fire away and ask your questions. There is a Q&A panel in the webinar uh, so we will try to answer questions there, but it's much more easier if you answer, ask those questions um, on a, um, on, like on a uh, live internet uh, format on Twitter. So uh, use the hashtag HeyTelerik if you are on Twitter, and then we can have a nice conversation. So we don't have to be done when we are done with the webinar. We can have an ongoing conversation about uh, your questions. So feel free to fire away any questions that you have, and we'll try to answer them on Twitter as we go along, and then Jessica will, I'm sure, um, answer those questions throughout the day as well. Uh, and also, if you have to run, if you have a meeting or your connection doesn't work for some reason, um, uh, be at peace that we are recording this in HD, and uh, as soon as we're done with the webinar, we'll try to uh, produce this and upload that to our YouTube channels as, as soon as we can. So again, ask your uh, ask your questions and uh, know that we are recording this webinar. Now, here's another reason why you should ask questions, because at the end of the day, the best question gets a brand new drone. And this should be amazing for geeks who love uh, photography uh, and for other purposes. Um, I, will, uh, uh, I will have the exact make and model by the time the webinar ends, but we are giving away a drone, which should be a really cool prize. So with that, um, Jessica, if you're ready, I'm going to hand it over uh, to you. Perfect. All right, let me quickly make you the presenter. Okay, and we are ready whenever you are. Perfect, I'm so happy to be here and welcome everybody. Uh, this is uh, evening for me, I know it's morning for some of you and I'm uh, so happy that you have uh, taken the time to join us for, for this se session, I should say. Uh, as uh, Sam said, this session is about UX, uh, and uh, let's see if we can draw some lines between the solid principles and, and uh, UX, as you suggested. The solid principles are made for developers, knowing that they actually have knowledge of the subject, and therefore it's formed as things that you should do. And the UX system I'm about to show you is formed as things you want to achieve and also how to avoid the things that can take away from that experience. Like instead of saying use white space, it's going to say that your app has poor grouping and physical challenge. So you will get the why and you now know why you should group and make sure the buttons are easy to click on and so on. So you will get the solution uh, right away, which I love. And of course, there are a bunch of other reasons for using white space, as in this example, but there is no reason to bring them up because we're removing 
the problem areas with and we get that white space automatically when we are using a good grouping and, and make sure we don't have any physical challenge. And, and this makes sense for people, especially that might not work with design for a living. And the beautiful thing is that this also makes sense for designers as well. So we can all use this system. And as humans, we kind of work that way. We spot the problems way easier than a lot of other things. So describing the problem to look for instead of just saying that you should use this and give no reason makes it a little bit easier to understand and find and implement, I think. So if you think back, have you ever used a system program or page that has been way too slow or way too complicated? And how many of those systems were actually internal systems? support systems that you use for work every day? I would say I'm guessing a lot of them are because sometimes the decision makers, they don't want to put money or development resources into internal systems like that because the client won't see it and we won't make any money out of it. And it's been working for this and this many years and we can make do, we have used it forever. But I, I uh, have an example here, I'm a consultant. And when I consult sometimes, I have to report my time in the client's system. So the example I'm going to show you is, uh, is real. Um, I go to a URL and I uh, log in and I click report time. And then I'm redirected to another page where I have to log in again for some reason. So I log in again and I get to a third page. And this has a completely different layout, completely different color scheme and everything. And I have to click report time again. And here I have to log in once more. This is the third time I'm asked to log in. And finally, I'm taking, taken to the place I can actually report my time. Now, this process takes about 16 to 17 seconds just to get to the time report. Now, imagine if you would actually take me to the time report with a direct link, the first page, and not redirect me over all of internet. It would take, what, one or two seconds? But let's say that. That case, we have saved or wasted in this case, we wasted 15 seconds every single time we do this. And that doesn't sound that much, but if this is a system we use every day, which is not unusual at a workplace, that's five minutes per month per employee in just one of the systems. Now imagine if you are a company where you have to log into this internal system three times per day, or even if you have three different systems you need to use. And we're a medium-sized company, 200 employees. All of a sudden that's 600 hours wasted per year. And now we're talking money. And this is not only about my experience anymore, this is also about the companies that are actually losing money not making us more efficient uh, when we work. This is um, one of, one of um, a best-selling UX books by a cognitive scientist and usability engineer uh, called Donald Trump. Eh, Donald Trump, I'm so sorry, Donald Norman. <laughs> and what I find kind of amusing about this book is that today it's called The Design of Everyday Things but it used to be called the psychology of everyday things. And I like that because in UX, there are a lot of similarities and psychology behind it. But rumor says that this book, when it was called the psychology of everyday things, had a little UX problem itself because the bookstores, they put it in the section of psychology, not uh, design or, or UX and things like that. So the people who actually wanted to buy the book couldn't find it. Now, I'm not sure if that is true or not, but they did change the name, so you never know. But that is, of course, not the only 
book on UX out there. There are a lot of information out there on, on user interfaces and user experience. And this is something we have studied for at least a century. Granted, it wasn't always studies on computer interfaces because computers is fairly new, but there are surprisingly few differences in user experience for physical everyday things to a software UI. So the question is, how in the world are we going to be able to read all those books and all those studies made? And how are we going to make sense of all that information? In development, there are a lot of conventions that we should follow, uh, but we could and we can um, boil them down to the solid principles, for instance. And the same thing is true for UX. There are hundreds of UX principles and laws and rules, but as a developer, there's often not enough time or resources to study and learn all of these. And the question is, should a developer do that? These guys are Michael Medlock and Steve Herbst, and they used to work at Microsoft UX research team. Um, I actually had the fortune to sit down with, uh, with them and, and it was a blast. They too thought there was too much information about UX, not too much, but there was a lot of information. And sometimes the information was kind of fluffy and not clear why something was bad or how you should fix it and so on. So they realized that there was so much research done and there was so many books that we just uh, saw they realized that it was nearly impossible to retain all that information, especially because the different books sometimes uses completely different vocabulary. So they started to analyze all the books they could get their hands on and boil everything down to something a little bit more comprehensible. All the information is out there and they just missed that clear, simple vocabulary for it. So they came up with a tool called Tennis and Traps. And this is something that uh, Microsoft, Google, Oculus, Facebook, Amazon actually uses internally to catch those pesky UX traps and problems out there. So I will base today's talk about uh, UX on these trap cards. And my goal with this talk is to show you that you can actually rock your user experience without reading all those books and studies and without becoming a UX specialist if you don't have the time or, or energy for that. So Tenets describes general attributes of good interface design. So everything that we want in a user interface. Traps describes common design problems that degrade all the goodness. So reduce the traps and the experience will improve. Tenets and traps are also related to each other. So each trap has a tenet that it degrades. For example, if someone says that your app is slow or doesn't respond, it will degrade it, uh, the tenet responsive. And this is uh, actually how a card will, um, how it looks. And this system has several strengths. First of all, it's the essence of a whole lot of existing heuristic tools and research, but it also separates the positive attributes from the negative ones in a very clear way. And in just instead of, of identifying the problem, it will also explain why the problem exists. It's also very easy to understand because it uses common language, which makes it so much more easy to communicate if you uh, run into problem or, or if, if a user comes to you with feedback and so on. There are a total of nine tenets, so nine good things, and all the tenets have at least one uh, trap. Some of them have more. I'm not going to talk about all the traps out there, uh, but if we look at the tenant understandable, as an example, it has uh, nine traps, nine things that will degrade understandable. 
nine things that will make your user experience less understandable and nine things, simply put, that you should avoid. Hey, Jessica. Mm -hmm. Sorry to interrupt. Um, I think we are able to see your uh, GoToWebinar control panel just kind of in between your slide oh. animations. So maybe just like minimize that. There That's we go. It. Yep. Is it out of the way? Yeah. Perfect. Sorry about that. So before we dive into deep, let's look at how we can actually work with these cards. The first thing you should do is identify a task that you want to test and you start with the most important one. So if we are Instagram, for example, uh, it could be share a picture because that's the main thing you do on Instagram, right? Then we walk through all the different ways the user can complete that task. So we can share an image uh, to Instagram from your gallery. We can open the camera and take a picture and share it to Instagram, or we can open the app and take a picture from there and so on. So we walk through all those ways. Then we identify and, and log any of the traps and problems we observe. And if you have time and, and resources, you can cross validate by having another, uh, another person also doing uh, the same kind of testing. So you can compare notes if, if you have uh, the means for that. And then you report back either to, um, to yourself or to your colleague uh, and um, you, you discuss what you found. Preferably you shouldn't test your own UI, but what you should do is listen for language like, I can't find any button or this is too slow. Um, this makes it so easy to pinpoint what trap it actually is. Sometimes though, it's not completely clear to see exactly what trap it is uh, you, you um, have a problem with. In that case, you can instead go up and see what tenant, what good thing am I having issues with and work from there. So there's two ways to approach this. So let's dive in. The first tenant is understandable. So when a UI is understandable, the user is aware of the action they can take because the UI contains concepts that are learned quickly. Like if I press download, I expect the file to download. Understandable is also that tenant that has the most trap. And I will show you five of them. Invisible element is where there is no perceptible way for the user to get to a given goal. There is no prior learning that would help the user overcome that lack of perceptible path. And then we have some, something similar and that is uh, effectively invisible. And this is when an element is visible somewhere in the UI, but the user doesn't interact with it. In other words, it is visible, but the user doesn't see it. And something that can steal our users' attentions is um, different type of distractions. And you all know about distractions, right? We have them all the time. I'm easily distracted. And memory challenge is another track we will look at. And this is when the system forces us to remember things that we as humans might have issues remembering, but the system would have a, a little bit easier time to do, but they are not remembering it for us. And the last trap here is um, forced syntax. And this is when the system doesn't allow the user to write or speak or act in a natural way for them. Now, let me start with a story about my mother. My mother, is as untechnical as they come. I'm not even kidding. Back when she had Windows XP, you remember those blue window you had everywhere, yeah? My brother though, he is as technical as they come. He is much younger than me, so he was born into this computerized world. And he's usually the one who supports my, my mother's uh, computers and, and stuff like that. So one day he went over there and he was just cleaning stuff up and he changed the color on uh, Windows XP. 
and back then you could have three colors. You could have um, a green, a dark green, and you could have a, have a chrome, I think it was, a dark chrome and the blue. So he, he changed it from blue to green. But my mom, she called me hysterically and said that he had ruined his her computer and he had removed all her games and she could do nothing. And I, I found that very odd because he wouldn't do that. The only thing my mom used her computer for was playing games. So I actually remoted in to see what was happening and I found the games just where they used to be on her desktop. And, and I moved around my, my cursor around the games and I say, they're right here on the desktop. And she said, no, 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 they're not. He removed them. Could you please install them? And I said, they are green now. They used to be blue, now they're green. So this is how untechnical my mom is, okay? Enter the day she got Windows 8 and my brother uh, got a new router for her. Now, when, when Windows 8 came around, she got a little bit more curious to how computer works and, and it was a little bit more fun for her. So she was super curious to how a router worked and how you connected it. So she was following him around. Oh, so you, you connect that here. Mm -hmm. Is this the internet? And asking him questions all the way. And then they came to actually, um, they were going to put in uh, the network settings. And my brother says, well, uh, this is the end of the line for you. Uh, you can go and, and have some coffee and something, do, do something else, this is not for you. And she's like, why? I wanna see how it works. Yeah, but uh, they have destroyed Windows with Windows 8. They have completely destroyed it. They have hidden the network settings. It's super complicated and it, this will take a while. So just go have some coffee. And she was like, but I don't understand. What, what is it that you're trying to do? Well, I'm trying to put in the password for, for the router. And all of a sudden she just swiped from the right and pressed settings and there it was. The super difficult hidden network settings. So how is it that my very non-technical mom couldn't find it, but my technical brother couldn't? Well, there are at least two factors uh, that affect our attention. It's the user's goal and expectations and the visual display of information and choices. So we have a couple of things going on here. There is no indicator to show my brother that there was an invisible element hiding if you swiped from the right. My brother also didn't expect to find it there. He was not used to that. And of course he didn't use the charm spar that much, so there was no learnings of this. My mom, on the other hand, when she installed Windows, she took every tutorial they asked her to because she was new to Windows. But my brother, he was like, well, I'm not new to Windows. I'm not doing any tutorials. And this was, of course, also not standard because this was completely new in Windows 8. So if we were to analyze this with the help of tenets and traps, we would listen for uh, things like, I can't find it or I can't see it. And if you can't see it, you can't really understand it in this case. So the trap here would be an invisible element and it drags down the tenant understandable. Now, don't get me wrong, invisible can be good when the discovery is guaranteed or when you don't miss out on anything if you don't know the keyboard shortcuts or the secret handshake, if you will. I love keyboard shortcuts, but I can still do the same thing in the menu. I teach at a school that uses a learning management system, and this is how it looked not that long ago. How do you create a new message? Well, you click the leaf, of course. Perhaps not the clearest choice of symbol. So this, for me, was an effectively invisible element. Um, fortunately, they actually changed it afterwards to something a little bit more clear. 
at least for me, to use. A UI element that suddenly appears, like um, notifications, um, will distract the user from their goal. Remember all those pop-ups we got in Windows before? And, and some of them actually sounded like you popped a balloon or something, I think. And that is a prime example of distraction. All types of animations and pop-ups and notifications are distracting to us. And uh, if you go to, to this page, I don't know if this will actually transfer very well on the webinar, but let's try it. This is um, a very fun page. Uh, they are doing this on purpose, though. Uh, this is a, a very successful uh, car salesman, used car salesman in uh, in England, I believe. Hey, Jessica. Mm -hmm. If I may interrupt for a second, just to yeah, sure. kind of maybe answer a couple of uh, questions that maybe time leaves. So um, uh, not to get political, I think uh, some of our folks um, do actually recommend Donald Norman for US president. But again, oh, that's, yeah. that's the fun part. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so Carl, um, Carl is asking uh, if all of these tenant cards, they're wonderful, but how are they to be used? Like by developers or do you uh, run them by your end users first? Um, anyone who is working with software can use them. Uh, actually, my husband, who is a backend developer and web developer, he uses them uh, to catch things before they release it to, um, to the user. So I would say not the end user, even though it's easy enough for the end user to use it. But if you want to catch whatever the user is having issues with, you're the one who is using it. Either you can have your, your design team, your UX team, or your developers using this. They are so easy to, uh, to use. Gotcha. And then I'm sure you will talk through this more, uh, but uh, Simone is asking if, uh, if there is one that's like the most common trap that developers fall into, the one that's most dangerous. Oh, that is an interesting question. That is so interesting. I don't know which would be the most common. I think there's a couple of them. I think uh, in understandable, the tenant understandable, you can find a couple of them that are, are um, common, like effectively invisible element when, when you're designing um, uh, your own UI elements or, or icons that make sense for you, but the user might not uh, make sense of it. Like the leaf I showed you that later became a pen for a new message. Um, that one is, is definitely um, common. Um, also, when you don't think about um, touch, if you're not developing uh, and trying it out on a touch um, device like your phone or, or something like that, and you don't think about having spacing between your buttons so you accidentally press two of them, that is also one I can come across uh, a couple of times, I would say. Uh, but I think there, there's not one single trap I can say that all developers do. I, I, I think we are just there, there are some up. popular ones, for sure. Oh, yeah. From what yeah, definitely. definitely. Let, let's go on. I mean, and, and I'll keep a look out and, and see which ones jump out more uh, as a developer. Perfect. Thank you. Sometimes the system forces the user to remember things that are easy to forget. And um, I'm one of those who have easy to forget things. And I thought that this actually was a thing of the past, back when everybody was using Yahoo Mail. But I recently ran into this again. You know, when you sign up for something and you are asked a question, uh, you are asked to choose a security question. And in this case, uh, if you forget your password, we need, to, we need to ask you a question so we know that we can send you the password. But you can only choose between a few questions, like what's your favorite pet or what's the name of your pet and things like that. So not only am I forced to remember my password, well, that's a given, but I'm also forced to remember what question I chose and also uh, the answer for that question. And sometimes they force me to use three questions 
So that is seven things I need to remember instead of just uh, one. Well, it would be easier if I actually remembered my password, of course, but that's not how I work. So this would be a memory challenge when the system requires me to remember a lot of stuff. Forced syntax is something that is becoming a little bit more common now when we have chat by bots and voice user interfaces everywhere. And this is when the system doesn't let the user type or say something in a way that feels natural for them. So if I had to say, Alexa, kitchen light dot state equals on instead of Alexa, turn the kitchen light on, it would be kind of forced. And in this case, it would be a forced syntax. And the same thing goes for chatbots. If you force people to answer yes and not take um, in consideration that sometimes people say yeah or yep and things like that. A UI is comfortable when the users can physically perform the actions quickly and physically effortless, I should say. And this includes that the user are able to read the text on the screen quickly and error free. So this is not only about physical stuff, but also, well, your eyes are in your physics. Yeah, you understand what I'm saying, right? Like I can show you some, uh, some examples here. If we look at physical uh, challenge, in, uh, for instance, this is when the user knows exactly what to do, but have a hard time doing it. Like this poor guy who is actually really want to click on something, but it's physical challenge for him to swipe or click or whatever he's trying to do. And this one is another one. When you have bad contrast between the elements or you're using a too small font, for instance, this will also become a physical challenge. A UI is responsive when it reacts instantly or at least fast to the user's in input. And this is, according to me, the most important one of them all. Um, might be because I'm a little bit impatient. But if you have even small delays, you can get a very dramatic effect on the user's behavior. And in, in cases where, where you have the most beautiful application with the best possible fit for you, if it's non-responsive, I will not use it, which is kind of sad. But since it's, this is an important one, I will actually go through both of the traps in here. There are two types of thresholds when it comes to response time. We have an absolute threshold and a relative threshold. Now the human threshold for detecting that time has passed, you usually say it's within 100 milliseconds of user activation. And this is the gold standard. So being much faster will do you no good because we won't notice. But it's also kind of hard at times to be this fast and, and uphold this time uh, everywhere in your application. And this is where the relative threshold comes into play. To be able to see the difference in performance between two web pages or two applications when you're not seeing them side by side, the difference have to be 20% or more. So you have 20% leeway uh, before the user actually will, will feel that your application is slower than, than the competitors. When the system doesn't respond to user activity or if it's too slow, so the user actually think that nothing is going to, uh, going to happen. And for me, I click hysterically or, or think that the app or page has actually froze. This is a slow or non-responsive trap. So to prevent things like that, you can make sure that you use confirmations that the user can see like a button that looks like it's being clicked, or you can give uh, continuous feedback if it's a process that will take more than a couple of seconds. And if it's a longer process than that, you can keep updating the user every 
two to five seconds so they know that the progress indicator is not frozen or the ring just keeps going but you don't know if actually something is going on so just keep updating them you don't have to say what you're actually doing just switch it up a little so it for this uh, yep yeah. sorry quick time out maybe a couple more questions sure keep so it coming a lot of people have a lot of people have asked, um, uh, where can uh, someone go and get these Tenets and Trap cards? Is there somewhere you can download, they can buy physically? Uh, this is a, a physical card, so you can buy them. And there is actually a link uh, in the very end of this talk. Okay, perfect. Is that good enough? Yeah, yeah, so we'll wait for that. And then a couple more things. Um, mm -hmm. Fritha is asking if the cards uh, also show the solutions to the traps, like on the flip side. Yes, it's, okay. um, yeah, I totally forgot to say that. Uh, so the cards have um, a header, which is the tenant. So you know what tenant it is. So in, in, in some case, in an example, you can have an understandable. And then you have an, um, what the trap is, so invisible element. And underneath that, they will say um, description in clear English. So uh, they, they will describe the problem. And if you turn around the card, you will get an, a real life example of how that trap uh, can look. And the only thing you need to do is remove the trap. And that's why it's so easy to, to work with. That's why I love working with it. If it's something that is invisible, you have to make it visible. It's uh, actually as easy as that. So yes, you will get um, information on, on how to remove it and, and how it looks in, in real life as well. Okay, perfect. Now, one more thing, uh, Jay Urban was asking, I think it's come up a couple of times on Twitter as well, and it's, it's a bigger conversation, so we can maybe just touch the tip of the iceberg and then we can kind of follow up at the end. Mm -hmm. A lot of uh, people who are making web applications today, um, we are also um, in, a, in a mode where those applications can now come to desktop and, and mobile devices. So, yeah. uh, for example, with web technologies, you can make uh, PWAs, progressive web apps that work mm -hmm. nicely on mobile devices. Uh, you could take the same web applications and shove them into an electron shell and then they start working on desktop. And then we have had, uh, kind of dealt with these things before uh, with uh, Kendo UI, which is our popular JavaScript library. Um, we make the controls responsive and touch friendly based on where you rendered those and where uh, you're running it. But do you have any like, general advice when web applications uh, need to come down and work on mobile devices or desktop? Are there any UX guidelines that you can recommend? Well, my recommendation is is uh, touch first, because if you are uh, if you have something that only works with with mouse and keyboard, uh, like if you have very tight menus and things like that, it will be hard to actually use touch uh, on those. But if you're doing the other way around, so you have uh, large enough margins so you can actually click with your fingers, it will automatically work with a mouse and keyboard because you could uh, press that even if you have a mouse and keyboard, right? Uh, so so that's that's my, my number one tip. Touch first, it will work everywhere. Got it. All right, let's move on. Yeah. So last trap in, in this one is um, um, captive weight. You know when you browse on YouTube and you watch one too many cat movies and there's this ad that you all of a sudden can't skip in four seconds. You can't back away from it and you can't change the movie clip because they will only start another one. So you just have to wait and, and sit there and look at the actual ad. And this is captive wait, which is also the last trap here. So let's go into the next tenet, which is efficient. And being efficient is something that most of us strive for. Uh, to do things in as few steps as possible or as fast as possible, right? So let's look at three of the traps here in uh, efficient. A UI is efficient when the user perceive that they are doing things in a min minimal number of steps. And the key word here is perceive. It doesn't have to be fewer steps as long as it feels like the user doesn't need to take unnecessary steps to finish something. And system amnesia, we will go into that. And this is when the system um, 
knows things about you, but all of a sudden it's forgot it. It will become clear, trust me. And then we have a bad prediction. And, and this is when we want the system to automatically perform an action on the user's behalf, uh, but in a manner that is consistent with users' expectations. So the big challenge here is to form an accurate prediction given the huge number of variables that actually might be correct. So let me show you some Swedish. This is what Swedish looks like for, for your non-speaking Swedes out there. This is what it looks like when you want to buy a movie ticket in Sweden. So what have I done here is I'm paying with a gift card here. Uh, so you get a little code and I'm prompted to show that I'm not a robot. This says I'm not a robot. And that's okay. I, I can definitely press that, but in this case, I ordered four tickets the same way with codes, and I'm prompted four times. If I wasn't a robot 30 seconds ago, I'm most probably not a robot now, right? And this is fine as long as it's only four movie tickets. But when we saw the last Star Wars movie, we were 18 friends who were going. So 18 times, I was not a robot. So it took some time, and this is definitely an unnecessary step. This is from Xbox One, uh, or Xbox.com, I should say, when uh, Xbox One was new to the market. Um, and if you browse there, you would find front and center, biggest ad you could find was, did you get an Xbox One? And then we also see Halo Spartan Assault. This is a really cool game. So, okay, that's fine. They want me to buy those things, right? But if we look down here on my recent activity, you can see that I recently played Halo Spartan Assault on my Xbox One. So this is system amnesia because down with my recent activity, they knew that I actually had played that on the Xbox One but all of a sudden it forgot. And this one is something you probably recognize, autocorrect. And a while back, this is, um, this is actually a real text. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm that geeky. Uh, <laughs> so for some reason, I had helped a couple of friends out uh, organizing a few DevOps events. And this is what I swiped. I swiped Deadpool is the best superhero but my phone auto-corrected it to DevOps. So it's predicted the wrong thing. So I simply had to go back to dev only events because my DevOps friends had way too much fun with this text, I could say. So this is a bad prediction, which we have to work around um, and correct the system. Forgiving, on the other hand, is perhaps the easiest tenant of the UML. Uh, a UI is forgiven when the user can undo whatever they just did, because we all make mistakes, right? And if we take Word, for example, uh, we have the ability to basically undo a whole document back to a blank one uh, with, with um, the control Z, if you are like me and like keyboard shortcuts, or undo in, in the interface. You have probably at some point filled out a form on the internet and then you realize when you're two pages in that you put in some information the wrong way or oh i should have used my other email because i don't want spam on this one so you go back and everything disappears so the trap here is irreversible action when i'm unable to undo an incorrect step i use Next tenant here is discrete, and this is also a, a tenant that only has one trap. And this is when the user can go about their business in a social context with no social disruption or embarrassment to themselves or anybody else, uh, then it's actually discrete. You wouldn't want the ATM to read out your pin code out loud, right? But it's also things like games on Facebook. And when, when, when was it? it was a couple of years back when Spotify got a Facebook connection, it showed every single song your friend was listening to, every single one. 
So that is definitely unwanted disclosure. A UI is protected when the user don't lose their data or work unintentionally. As I said, I'm, I'm organizing a lot of events and most of them are hackathons and, and code evenings and things like that. And to stretch the sponsor money, we, to be able to do more events, we uh, do a lot of things manually. So we drive to the supermarket and, and we buy all the stuff ourselves. And this was, early Saturday morning, we were doing a hackathon in the city center and we live a bit off, uh, off the road, so to say. Uh, so we drive to the supermarket and this is what we bought. We bought a lot of stuff. Uh, I think it was over 200 energy drinks and, and we bought a lot of sodas and candies and snacks and what have you. And I was using a self scanner, which allows me to scan every single item so I don't have to put everything up on the, the conveyor belt and to the register. But the problem was that when I was ready to pay, my scanner died. So I'm kind of panicking because I'm supposed to be opening this hackathon very soon and we haven't even started driving there. So I went up to, to the store clerk and, and was kind of panicking because I had hundreds and hundreds of items that I thought I had to rescan. So I give her my scanner and she switches out it to another one. And it says, welcome Jessica, and showed me every single thing I have scanned. So that is to be protective and this is what we should strive for. So having to click commit your changes or having to click save to commit your changes is most likely redundant and kind of old fashioned because this is something that we had to do back when computers didn't have much memory and storage didn't come as cheap as it does today. So the trap here is data loss. So always save the user's data somewhere so you can retrieve it again if something goes wrong. As humans, we can't help but to learn habits. It's kind of hardwired into us. And this is something that is sometimes overlooked when it comes to interface design. And it is something that we can actually take advantage of. A UI is habituating when over time the user does things automatically without even thinking. And if a UI is habituating, it will lead to efficiency and understanding. So I will show three traps on habituating. If the visual appearance for a given action changes across the UI, we will have an inconsistent appearance. A UI has a single home when there is one conceptual place that the user perceive at the starting point of the app or homepage. And a UI is non-redundant when there is one single way in the interface to accomplish a given task. So let's start with inconsistent appearance. To create new, there are a lot of different icons and symbols used today. Outlook uses a pen to create an email, which is kind of funny because sure we can use a pen to write emails, but it's kind of like the floppy image for, for a save button, I think. Twitter uses a quill and some use of documents and, and a star and so on, which means that we will definitely have an inconsistent appearance here, which will make it a little bit slower for us to find what we're trying to do. What is the two main things you would do on Facebook? Post things and keep in contact with people, right? So let's look at keeping in contact with people or more specifically send an instant messaging or an instant message. How many ways can you do that? How many ways can you start an IM? Well, this is only a few of them. There are a lot of ways to start an IM and which might be an issue when my mom calls and, and wants help with a message because I don't know how she is doing it because she's, she might not be doing it the same way I do. But that's not the only problem. 
when a user is presented with multiple choices, it will take a longer time to decide what method to use. If they only had a fewer options, it would be so much faster. Uh, so having 10 different options to send an IM is definitely a gratuitous redundancy here. Hey, Jessica, maybe mm -hmm. a quick break. Uh, sure. Joe Queen or Hulk Queen um, has asked if uh, there is guidance on how to handle hover-based uh, UI uh, for touch environments. And I think this is a pretty um, popular question. I mean, do you have guidance on that? Oh, yeah, that is interesting. There are um, a couple of different ways to do it, but I have not yet seen something that is standard. And that is kind of what we are striving for, um, using something that is striving, that we are um, used to doing, so we can get that habituating going. And I don't have a clear answer to that. I don't have a, a one-stop answer for that, actually. Uh, well, I mean, it kind of goes back to the invisible tenant. Like, I mean, maybe things yeah. should not be so invisible in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Definitely. If, if yeah, it, Definitely that, and also effectively invisible, because if you are kind of hiding things in, in hover that the user might need to interact with uh, in touch, you might need to show them uh, the real thing as well. Right. All right, so um, Humberto, if I'm pronouncing that name right, is asking like, how, you, how do you create a culture where you value uh, UX for your apps and you prevent uh, requirements kind of uh, enforcing how the UI looks like. Oh yeah, that is so different in different companies uh, and, and, and environment. Um, start by acknowledging that there is actually a user. There is an end user because if you can get that into your, your um, culture that you are doing this for the user, uh, it will become so much easier to get more and more user experience uh, work done and, and uh, implement that and maybe even get resources for it. Uh, I, I would say start with, with acknowledging that there's a user and talk about the user and not just your next release, if you will, because sometimes that's what we get caught up in, right? Yeah. I mean, essentially showing the value of, of UX and how yeah things don't work out if you don't pay, pay attention to it. Yeah. All right, so we have maybe around eight minutes more, so we, let's be conscious of time. I'll let you go and I will not interrupt you anymore and then we can answer some questions at the end. Sure thing, let's do this. Um, we all feel a little better when we have a sense of home and can find our way around, right? And this is also true for UX or UI, if you will. Um, a UI has a sense of home when there is one conceptual place that the user perceive as a starting point, like a start page or, or similar. And as users, we can actually get slower and, and a little bit confused when there isn't one clear starting point. And I would say that this is only for some apps, um, maybe most of the apps. If you only have a one pager or you're a camera app or, or an information page with only one or two pages. You don't, of course, don't want uh, to put in an extra page just to to have a start starting point. So you you need to think about that as well, of course. But if there is no sense at home, we get an ambiguous home instead, and this is exactly what it sounds. There isn't one single place where the user can return to and get reoriented and and start a new task and so on. There, there was an issue with the Xbox 360, if some of you uh, used to be on that. You had one home when you pressed the large Xbox button, and then you got back to the dashboard, which was the starting page. But then there was another home when you pressed the info button. So there was some confusion to what home you should go to do uh, whatever you were intending. Some of them were very clear, but some of them was a little bit confusing and you didn't know exactly where to look. But ambiguous home can also be the other way around. Netflix uh, came to Xbox One not that long ago. And if you think about it, what category would you put Netflix in? It's true for so many different um, categories. We have videos and apps and entertainment and children and so on. When, they net, when Netflix launched, 
you could find it in 10 different places, which means that they definitely did not have a sense of home. Sure, you would find it wherever you went, but they later actually fixed that, so it's not everywhere this time. The last tenet and also the last trap of the day is beautiful. And although that it might sound obvious that a beautiful UI will appeal to the user, there are still too many UIs out there that has been a little bit ne neglected or not prioritized on this part. Now, what is beautiful is, as you all know, individual and impossible to pinpoint, but when apps are clearly made for one platform and get released on multiple platforms, uh, like when you have a back button in the UI on Android or Windows phone that actually has a hardware button, it will be um, go under the trap um, that degrades uh, beautiful. So it will be an unattract unattractive appearance. How many would actually be feeling safe putting in your credit card in a machine like this? If we look at it, the uh, boxes are not even aligned and it doesn't look professional. And the handwritten notes doesn't really give it more credibility, does it? And therefore, this will definitely go in under unattractive appearance. So it doesn't have to be the most beautiful app in the world. It just has to look professional, if you understand what I'm saying. Another thing that goes in under unattractive appearance is when you don't utilize a different platform design languages out there. So Google has material design, Apple has human interface design, Microsoft has Microsoft design language or Fluent. So what you can do is to make sure that you give the design part of the project a fair amount of time and also read up on the design guidelines for the platform you are publishing on. And today we live in a world where internet is getting faster and faster and there's new apps and services released constantly and the sheer amount of apps and web pages is mounting up like crazy. So we're also thinking about things like diversity and inclusion and things like that today. And this means that UX will be so much more important than ever. Because if your app or web page is a little bit slow or not as clear, to use your, as your competitors, and if we don't have a good experience for the user, we will lose our credibility and we will lose our users and we might even lose money. So try not to get lost in your next release or stuck in your massive backlog and everything we are developing, we are developing for the users. So I would say be like Tron, because he fights for the users. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Yes, we do. We actually Perfect. have a lot of questions, which oh. I don't think we will have a time to answer all of them. The good news is um, you will see a lot of questions on Twitter, which I actually did not answer, because I mean, I, I want you to be answering those things, but they're all marked with the hashtag hate lyrics, so we can have an ongoing conversation um, when the webinar ends. So a couple more questions, I guess, um, on the Q&A panel. Uh, Katrina was asking, uh, after all of these like um, uh, tenets and traps, like what's the solid principle? Is what you're calling all of these combination of all of these traps, is, what, is that what you're calling solid? Yeah, well, it might not be the best analogy. Uh, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Um, but what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that we have these nine things, these nine tenets that we can keep track of. It's not uh, so difficult to actually remember those nine things. And if you also have the cards, you will have a, a cheat sheet with all the traps and tenants on one page. So you don't have to uh, work too much to actually see them as an overview. And also they are kind of, um, they make sense to me as the solid principles does, if, if that answers the question. All right, um, another question that's come up several times, and I'll read maybe the one that Chris Polly is asking. Um, do any of these UI traps um, take into consideration accessibility needs uh, for your apps? Yes, some of them do. 
some of them doesn't. Uh, there are different types of accessibility, of course. Um, uh, colorblindness, of course, is, is one of them. And if you don't have a good enough contrast, it will be caught here. But you might want to check uh, with an, uh, an, a, a tool for that as well. So you're actually making sure for that. Uh, but definitely, it will take uh, some of it into consideration. Okay. Um, Devon is asking if there are any UX certifications that maybe uh, are widely recognized. Oh, interesting. Uh, let me get back to that. Is that okay? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, just so you all know on who are on the call, uh, we will uh, get all of your questions and then we'll uh, likely write up uh, a blog post where we can kind of expand on some of these answers because we will not have time to answer all of them today. All right, so um, let me see, uh, maybe just one or two more questions. Uh, as developers, like how do you know, like you have gone through all of these traps and you have made sure um, that you're doing the right things and you have the right solutions. How do you know at the end of the day that you have done UX right? Like is there, is like usability testing the only way to go? Well, if, if you can't find one single trap, um, that is amazing, first of all, if you're actually uh, taking away all of them. Um, of course, testing is the ultimate test, right? But if you don't get any complaints, if you don't have um, the resources to, to do user research and, and have your app being tested uh, in that sort of environment, if you don't get any, get any uh, complaints, you're probably off to a good start, I would say. But ha have your mom tested. Test it out on, on your colleagues uh, that does not work on that system and, and things like that to make sure if you don't have the, uh, the resources, I would say. Okay, uh, probably one last question. Orlando is asking if there is, in your experience, if out, out of all these traps, like is there one that you actually do not quite agree with in, in real, uh, like real apps? Um, well, Yes and no. It depends on what you're doing. I do agree with every single one of them. Uh, but if you are doing games, for instance, uh, having being able to finish a game is as, in a, as few steps as possible might not be the best idea. So then you have to remove some of, of, um, of the trap cards if you're going to test it on games. And also on uh, same goes for shopping. Uh, because there's there's a lot of psychology behind shopping and how shopping pages and and, and apps works and there will be gratuitous redundancy which is fine in that case uh, but i couldn't cannot say that i disagree uh, with any of them um, they, they make sense to me in in a broader sense yeah makes sense all right, so, I mean, we knew, knew this going in. I mean, it's UX and we can have um, endless conversations about uh, the best way of doing things. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, we do want to thank everybody who uh, who joined us. Uh, I think we had over a thousand people. Uh, so thank you again uh, for all your time. Uh, now, what you have on the screen is the Twitter handle uh, for uh, Jessica and me, and Jessica is really the experts here. Um, so please keep uh, asking us questions and, and feel free to ping Jessica or me at any time uh, so we can have ongoing conversations about what's right uh, and, and wrong and in how we use these uh, internets and traps. And like I said, we will likely take all of your questions and uh, write them up in a, in a post so we can expand on some of these answers. Um, so Jessica, any parting thoughts? No, I think it's a, actually a really good idea to, to sum them up like you suggest so we can read them back later as well. Absolutely. And we'll keep on answering questions with the Hey Telerik hashtag on Twitter. So that's an ongoing conversation. All right. So Jessica, I do want to thank you a lot uh, for your time uh, and your expertise that you shared with us. Uh, and I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, we will do a lot more with UX. I mean, we have all types of UI for .NET and JavaScript across different types of platforms, but I think we will pay a little more attention to UX and uh, how developers can get this right. And uh, you, you are uh, clearly a resource who can help us out uh, get this story straight. So uh, thank you again, Jessica, and thanks uh, thank you so to much. everybody who joined. And I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day, and we'll see you next time around.